Welcome back to another tutorial. Today, we'll be recreating Nonsense by Artie Fiber. This is a puzzle game wherein you have an assortment of colored blocks. The objective of this game is to move them so that they are not adjacent to any blocks with a different color. We will be doing a recreation of its mechanic as well as implementing some features such as locks and mini blocks. With that being said, let's get started. Before we get into coding the thing, let's first discuss the assets that we'll need for making this game. We will obviously need the colored blocks, it's completely up to you to decide how many colors you'll want in your game, but for the sake of this video, we'll only stick with 4. I made the regular versions which are 2x2 two two in size, as well as the smaller versions which are 1x1. One one. It's also worth noting that their bottom faces are all unglued, which stops the block from sticking to anything below them. To remove the glue of a block, you can edit it and click the brick button. Then, you can tap or drag along the areas you'd want to be unglued. Next, we have the tiles for the blocks to be placed upon. Again, one has a regular size while the other has a smaller size. It's important for the top face to have a lighter color than the one at the bottom. And also, make sure that both your tiles and blocks have a box collider. You can modify those by clicking the gear icon when selecting the object. Then, we have the cross marks to determine if the block is next to a differently colored block, as well as the locks. Finally, we will need the vector lerp to smoothen up our positions. This is a custom script block which can be located in Fanscripts by Sonoc. You will be able to find this project inside the blocks tab in the build section. The first thing we have to do is to set up the data to pass into our main code. Let's start with the blocks, which will have two properties. The color of the block, and the size of the block. So, let's bring in a play sensor to ensure that this only runs at the start of the game. We'll assign this object to a global list. And for the color, let's change it to 1. For the size, we want it to be at 0, and since the default value of a number is 0, we can actually just leave that part out. Let's add an increment to the list length to update the list. Afterwards, let's duplicate this code and attach it to the rest of our blocks. However, we'll update the color to guarantee that no two blocks have the same value. For the mini versions, let's copy the code and paste it here. This time we would have to assign the block size, and we would want to set it to 1. Then, let's repeat the process we did earlier, duplicating the code and updating the color value. Let's move on to our tiles. We only need to look after one property, which is the size, so we'll bring in the play sensor, assign the object to a global list, and again, since the default value of a number is 0, we don't need to add any code to set that, so we'll finish it off with an increment for the list length. For the small tile, that's where we'll need to assign the size value to 1. Now that we're done initializing our blocks, let's proceed to the main code. We'll remove all of this junk and construct a simple level with two colored blocks. Let's create a scope block to hold all of our game logic. And now we'll kick it off with the initialization stuff, starting with our tiles. In the original game, they possess a checker design to make it easier to see where to place the blocks. We will be mimicking that style, but first we need to break down the logic of how this will go. Say we have a small grid of blocks and want to create some checkers. What do you think we should do? Well, if you take the sum of these blocks x and z positions, notice how they're all even numbers. Likewise, if you take the sum of these blocks x and z positions, you can see that they're all odd. We'll be using this information to tell the game which blocks to flip. So let's loop through all the tiles and save all the necessary information to variables. If you remember earlier, the top faces of these tiles are all lighter than the ones below. Therefore, we'll essentially rotate half of these blocks to make the pattern. To do so, let's break the vector position of our tile, then we'll get the sum of our x and z values, floor it to get rid of the decimals, 
and use a modulo where the device is set to 2 to clamp our values to 0 and 1. Then, let's multiply the result by 180. In theory, if the number we get is 0, the tile will be left unchanged. However, if it's 1, then the tile will be flipped. Let's see if it works. And it doesn't! Why is that? Well, if we inspect the sum of our x and z positions, notice how all our values are even. Since our tiles are 2 by 2, they are all spaced apart by 2 blocks. This means that they will all be even. To fix this, let's divide them by 2 by scaling the vector by 0 0.5. And as you can see, it now all works properly. Next, let's also initialize our blocks. We won't add much to it for now, though we might as well save the position to a variable. We now bring our attention to the camera, which the game currently lacks right now. Let's use variables for all our cam data. For the rotation, we'll set x to 75 to have a top-down view with some tilt. For the position, we'll use the get size block to obtain the farthest points for our level, and then we find the average to get the center. For the range, let's get the distance of these two vectors and multiply it by 4. Then, let's bring in a set camera block and attach all the variables. And right now it's way too zoomed in, so let's increase this number to 5. This looks fine as it is, and you can leave it like that, but let's change the viewing mode to perspective. It's totally zoomed in right now, so let's change a couple of things. We'll add an offset to our position, which is pointed towards our camera rotation. Let's set the Z position to negative 25. Okay, now it's way too zoomed out, so let's decrease this number to 2.5. For the lighting, let's play around with the rotation until we have something that works. We now have to work on the controls. First, let's have an if condition to make sure that this doesn't run once the game is stopped. Then, let's bring in a touch sensor with its mode set to touching. We'll get the position of where our player is tapping by using a screen to world block to convert these coordinates to vectors. Let's connect this directly to a variable and inspect its value. You can see that its y position is somewhere around 24.7, which is higher than what we would like. If we connect it to the other plug and press play, you can see that the y position is way too low now, so what do we do? Well, I think this is the perfect time to introduce the line versus plane block, which can be found in the math section. Say we have a line that passes from point A to point B, as well as a plane in between. The point where the two meet is the intersection. What this block does is find a point at which the line intersects the plane. Let's also briefly talk about the inputs. Line from and line to are the start and end positions of your line. Plane point determines the height of the plane, and plane normal determines the direction the plane is pointing at. Since our camera is not completely looking down, we'll plug in the plane point and the plane normal to the same vector to adjust a plane towards our cam rotation. Let's set the y position to 1.5, as that is where our blocks are currently lying. And if we check the values, you can see that the y value is now at 1.5. Well, there's going to be very slight inaccuracies, but it's too insignificant to pose a problem to us. Next, we'll place another touch sensor, but this time set the mode to begins as we only want to run this at the start of the touch. From here on out, we'll be writing a code that allows the player to choose a block, but how do we do that? Let's say we have three blocks aligned next to one another, and our tap position is somewhere in between. We could have a variable determining the distance a block can be selected. We could then loop through each block, get its distance from the tap position, and compare it with the value of our variable. If it's less than the variable, then that means the distance we have is closer. Therefore, we could update the variable with this value, tell the game we have a lead, and say this block is the closest one. Let's go to the next block. Its distance is even closer than the value before, so we update our variables. Let's go to the final block, and this time the distance isn't less than the value before, 
so we make no changes. At the end of the loop, we would have our chosen block. For our distance, I'll set it to 2 so we could have enough area to select our blocks. I'll use a truth variable set to false to know whether the game has found a close enough object. Let's bring in a loop to go through our blocks and check if the distance between the tap position and the object position is less than the variable. If it is, then we update best and assign the index as our current block. We'll also set our boolean to true to let the game know that we found something. At the end of the loop, let's check if our truth variable is set to true. For now, let's attach a sound effect just to see if it works. And as you've noticed, we don't hear anything if we're clicking away from our blocks, but once we tap nearby, the game plays a sound. Let's set a truth variable to tell the game that our player is holding a block, as well as add another property to our blocks for them to know whether they're currently being dragged. And we'll finish it off with a plop sound effect. Let's bring in a loop to run over our objects. I will monitor our index and object using variables. The first thing we'll add here is an if statement checking if it's the current block, and if this returns false, then we want our block to stay in place. Otherwise, we want our block to move towards wherever the player's finger is. Let's add a little hover by increasing the Y position. We'll then use a vector lerp to gradually update our block's position. We'll set the current position as a starting point, V as our endpoint, and set the amount to 0 0.25. Let's bring in a set position to finalize those changes. When we press play, you can see that our selected block follows wherever we hold the screen. Let's also apply some rotation to our blocks. If it's idle, we want to keep the block stationary, so let's set this value to 0 across all axes. If it's the current block, however, then we want to add a little bit of swing. For this, we will be using the sign block from the math section. What this block does is compute the sign of an angle in degrees. I don't want to delve too deep into trigonometry, but here's the gist of this function. If the input is 0, then the output is, well, 0. If it's 90, then the output is 1. If it's 180, then the output is again 0. If it's 270, then the output is negative 1. And if it's 360, then we have a full rotation and return to 0. All of this forms a continuous wave that ranges from negative 1 to positive 1. This block is particularly beneficial for producing this back and forth movement, which is what we'll be using to rotate our block. We'll use the current frame block to have a constantly increasing number, and we multiply it by the speed of the wave. We then attach it to the sign block and multiply the value by the magnitude of the wave. Let's also use a lerp to smoothly update our block's rotation, set the current rotation as the start, r as the end, and the amount to 0.125. Finally, let's plug the variable to the set position, and as you can see, our block is now wobbling. Finally, let's write the code regarding what happens once the player lets go. We'll bring in another touch sensor, but now the mode is set to ends. We only want to run this if the player is dragging the screen. If this receives an input, we set both drag and BS curve to false, and as a result, our block returns to its original position when we stop holding. However, we also want the player to move blocks, and leaving it like this does not help them in any way. Therefore, we need to add more stuff. We want to check if there's any tile underneath once we let go of the block. To do so, we'll be projecting a raycast. Let's take the tap position, floor the x and z positions, set the y to 3 to start from the top, and make a vector. We'll add an offset of 0.5 in both the x and z values, and I'll show you why this is specifically important in a second. Let's attach this to the starting point of the raycast, and for the end point, let's subtract the vector by 5 blocks in the y direction to have it go down. If it returns true, we'll get the detected object, store it in a variable, and loop through all the tiles. Inside the loop, we'll check if the tile corresponds to our hit object.
And if it does, then we'll update the volley of PS, which is the block's fixed possession, to be on top of the tile. We'll also update the block's position to have it instantly move there. Let's add a hit sound effect and increase the pitch. I forgot to set this variable to be cur, which is the index of our current block. I also forgot to change this to tap. And now everything seems to be functional. Let's introduce the mini blocks and tiles into the level. Everything should be fine, right? Oh. The reason why this doesn't work is that we scaled the vector by 0 0.5. But since the small tiles are already spaced apart by one block, we don't need to run this code. Therefore, we must check the tile size before executing the snippet. Let's fix the name of this variable to be ts size. And as you can see, the tiny tiles now have a checkered pattern. However, we have another problem. You can drag the small blocks and place them on the large tiles. To mend this issue, let's go back to this chunk of code and check if the size of the tile underneath and the current block are equal. Make sure to globalize the variables, and now we can freely move our blocks and only place them on their corresponding tiles. Also, the reason why we added an offset of 0.5 is to account for both the regular and small tiles. The position of a 2x2 two two block placed on a level will always have an integer for its x and z positions. However, the position of a 1x1 one one block will always have a 0.5 at the end. So, if we get rid of this offset, although we'd be able to detect the regular tiles, we can't say the same for the small tiles. Basically, you can have a value of 0.5 inside of 1, but you can't have a value of 1 inside 0.5. Now let's bring in the locks to the game. Firstly, we need a way to assign them to our block, so we'll be using a marker as a starting block and create a little indicator. Let's place this at the top of the block that we want to lock. Inside a script, we'll store the position in a global list update the list length, and hide the object. The last step was also why I didn't opt for a script block. Afterwards, we need to initialize our locks in the main code. We'll loop through all the items inside the list and use a raycast to check for any object underneath. Then, let's use an equals object and attach the variable. And if this returns false, our variable must point to an actual object inside the level. If that's the case, let's create a loop for all our blocks and use another equals object to find where our variable is pointing towards. Once we find that object, we'll add another property to that block to tell the game that it's locked. We also have to create an icon to be our indicator. Let's assign a marker to be cloned based on the block size. Generate a copy via create object and assign it to a list. If we return to the section where we update our blocks, we can update the lock's position by using V, which is the goal position for lerp and add an offset to place it on top of the block. And as you can see, the lock block now has a little gray icon above. However, we can still move it since we haven't written the code to lock it yet. If we pan towards this part of the code where we assign the current block, we can add another if condition to check if the block is locked. If this returns false, then we can continue as normal and select it as a current block, Otherwise, we can play a clang sound effect to imply that it's not possible. Let's now add the X's to indicate if a block is next to a block with a different color.
First, we must determine which icon to use depending on the block size. This particular marker is not centered, so we'll also use an offset of 0 0.0625 to help us with position it later. For the other marker, it's already in the middle so we don't need to have any offset. Afterwards, since we would want to check the block's adjacency in 4 directions, let's add a loop that runs 4 times. We'll clone our object and save it to not just any list but a 2D list. What is a 2D list? Well, imagine an ordinary list as a box filled with books. Each book inside that box is called an item, consisting of one value and one value only. Now, what if that box is actually inside of a larger box? So now we have this crate filled with boxes of books. Each item inside that crate can contain many values depending on how big that box is. This crate is what we call a 2D list. In its simplest terms, it's a list of lists. However, due to Fancade's limitations, we cannot simply attach a get list to another get list, so we'll use a workaround. We can represent a 2D list using rows and columns. Since all of our boxes have a fixed size, we can separate them using the number of columns. If we have four columns, then the first four books belong to box A, then the next four belong to box B, and so on and so forth. Using a 2D list will be the key towards storing all of our cross marks inside one big array instead of creating a new list for every block. To do so, we'll multiply the block index by 4, which is the number of x's we'll create, and add that to our loop counter. Finally, let's keep track of the icon offset via a regular list. Afterwards, let's update the location of our markers. What we want to do is to position our icons based on their index. For instance, the first marker goes up, the second goes right, the third goes down, and the fourth goes left. Therefore, we must take care of two things, magnitude and rotation. Let's focus on the first one. For the magnitude, we would want to have a vector of 0, 0, 1 and scale it based on the block size. If we have a 2x2 two two block, we don't need to make any changes to the vector and leave it as it is. However, if we have a 1x1 one one block, we must scale it by half. So if our dividend is 1, then the divisor must be either 1 or 2. Therefore, we need to increase the value of BS size, our block size, by 1. Next, let's focus on the rotation. We'll use the block's fixed position as our base and add an offset. We'll take V and rotate it, and we'll use the loop index and multiply it by 90 to get those four cardinal directions. Then, we'll use that position to update our cross marks location. Make sure to target everything in the 2D list by bringing that add and multiply. We'll take our vector position, increase the y position by 1, and add our icon offset. We'll also turn the y rotation to 45 degrees. And now, you can see all of the cross marks. If we leave the level, you can also see them in the box art, which is something that we would want to avoid. So, we can simply use a box art sensor and hide them. The last thing in our code that we have to do is the checking system. We would only want to show these cross marks if the block they're adjacent to has a different color. The first thing I'll bring out is a late update block. In Fancade, the game goes through three phases each frame. First, it runs scripts. This accounts for almost every code you place inside the level. Second, it simulates physics. It does every calculation regarding physics and simulates them in the game. Then third, it runs late update scripts which is any code you want to execute after the physics simulation. Basically, we want to trigger this checking system once everything has been executed and processed. We'll have an if condition to see if we've done our checking already. If we haven't, we set it true to only run it once. And let's loop to all of our blocks. Inside that is another loop that runs four times, 
And from here, we can check our block sites and look for any object directly adjacent to them by using a raycast directed towards those. We'll check if this object is empty, and if it isn't, then let's loop through all of the blocks and find our object. Let's use a boolean to monitor if the block is next to a differently colored block. We'll also be using an or block, a logic gate that returns true if either of its inputs is true. This means that if the second input is true, then our variable will be true and will always be true for the rest of the loop. We'll use an end block to combine two more conditions. A to check if the block is equal to our detected object and B to check if the color of the hit block is different from the color of our initial block, which is why we'll use a not block. Afterwards, let's update the visibility of our error sign to whatever the state of our variable is. We also have to initialize our boolean before the loop, as well as set check defaults whenever we move a block. And as you can see, the cross marks now indicate that our red blocks are adjacent to a blue block, which updates once we grab them around. Finally, let's add a win condition. We'll set it to true at the start of the loop, and once there is still an error present in our mixture of blocks, we set it back to false. Since our end block only returns true if both the inputs are true, this will always be false for the rest of the loop. At the end of it, if this boolean is still true, then that means our blocks are all apart from one another. We'll set the stop variable to true to disable our controls, play a marimba sound effect, and attach a win block. Now that we're done coding the game, it's up to you to design your levels. In this footage, I am combining all of the features we implemented throughout this tutorial into a single level. Make sure that your main code is at the bottom of the level to ensure everything runs properly. We have now reached the end of this tutorial. I hope you learned a lot with this video. If you ever have a problem with your code, you could always check out the GitHub link in the description. Anyways, I'll see you at the next one.